and welcome back to AWS reInvent. We are here streaming live from the Venetian in the Sands Expo Hall. My name is Nikki, I'm a technical evangelist for AWS, and I'm joined by some of the members from the Amazon SageMaker and AWS Step Functions teams. Guys, why don't you introduce yourselves? Hi, my name is Andy Katz, I'm a product manager with Step Functions. Hi, my name is Tom Fallhaber, I'm the principal engineer for Amazon SageMaker. And I'm Kumar Venkateswar, I'm a principal product manager in the Amazon SageMaker team. So we've definitely mentioned some service names that you might not know. So guys, let us know, what is uh, Amazon SageMaker and what is AWS Step Functions? Why don't you start with SageMaker? Sounds good. Uh, Amazon SageMaker is a managed machine learning platform that allows you to build, train, and deploy machine learning models. It's the easiest and fastest way to get up and running with machine learning, and we're super excited about the changes that we've announced today. And I'm with uh, AWS Step Functions, which is a fully managed workflow service that allows you to build resilient, serverless workflows with less code to maintain and manage, uh, as well as no servers to provision or manage. Um, AWS Glue is a service that also allows you to run fully managed extract, transform, and load ETL jobs on AWS. So, awesome. Briefly, before we talk about what's launched, I don't know what that noise was, what are some challenges that uh, customers face when building machine learning models? So there's quite a few challenges, but among the challenges include the uh, inability to debug and understand how to go back from uh, uh, what's deployed into production all the way back to the data that they trained with, uh, to organize together multiple workflows, and to be able to uh, really orchestrate the entire process of machine learning so that they can get it into production in a, in a systematic way so that they can reproduce it. Making it more accessible to developers and businesses. Exactly, exactly. So what did you guys launch today? So one of the things you may have heard about today is we've added more service integrations to AWS Step Functions, including SageMaker and Glue, which now allows you to automate these machine learning workflows. And maybe the easiest way to understand it is, let's take a look at one. Yeah. So if you look at my screen, what you're seeing is a workflow definition for a machine learning workflow. It's going to download data, run a training model on SageMaker, create a model, and then do batch transform inferences in that model. And I'll know at the end whether this job succeeded or failed, and if it failed, at what step. So as a first point, let's kick one off. We can kick them off in two places. One place is within the Step Functions console. We're looking in that visual workflow in Step Functions right now. And what I can do is start an execution. Maybe we'll steal the input from a prior execution. So this is a machine learning workflow using SageMaker in AWS Step Functions. Is that correct? That is correct. Exactly. So we'll start an execution. And we'll give it as input my S3 bucket. Give me one moment to edit this. And we'll call this um, uh, notebook run seven. I must spell. I start the execution. What we'll see is that execution now is running. And in step functions, the first step is downloading. That state is blue. When it's complete, it will turn green and we'll move on to the training step. So now you can basically watch data run through every step of the workflow. Exactly, and I can look down below and see step by step what Step Function is doing, and in this case, we actually entered the first state, we started an execution, and we started a Lambda function that's doing that work. Now I can also start these things from inside a Jupyter Notebook using the Boto3 SDK. So an example of that is if I go to this notebook, I've got a series of uh, functions that I've created, and one of which is I can start a workflow. And in this case, I'll start the workflow, and I'll give this one maybe workflow run number eight, and when I execute that in the notebook, same things happen. We've kicked off a workflow. And if I check the status of my workflow, I can see that this workflow is currently running. Cool. And I can also find out where my workflow is. So for example, if I look at that first one I launched, number seven, I get that same list. It's currently training. If we go back to and the And it's going to be training for a while. We'll see that it's training. And in fact, I can also see from the console how many workflows are running. I can see the ones I've run, whether they succeed or failed, and the two that are currently running. And I can do that either from the console or from my notebook. Now, while we're letting the train, Tom will show you one of the new features that was announced earlier this week as well. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see another demo. Yeah, we got, we got lots so of features to show. I feel so lucky I get two demos so, in one segment. So, what Andy just showed you there was, was Step Functions integration that lets you run orchestration at scale. There are lots of other ways people want to collaborate and work with stuff. Um, one of the most common things we've found is for notebooks, people want to share their code in their notebook and they want to preserve it. So I want to show you a new feature of SageMaker, which is Git integration with the notebook. Um, 
Now first let me show you how this works. Everyone wants to be able to work with a Git repo. I'm just going to show you how this is on the console and then we'll jump to one that I already have set up. Um, but here, I want to be able to uh, connect to a Git rep repository. You see we have Git repositories on the console right now. I can connect to one. I've got one called Workshop. This is meaning I'm connected to a Git repository for a workshop. It's actually a workshop that we gave um, a couple of months ago on SageMaker, and all that data was in, in Git, so I can just start my notebook with that. It will be pushing back to that. Ah, so, so you on. no longer have to start up a Jupyter Network notebook and clone the repo. Now you can just start exactly from the root of your, uh, right. of your repository. And this is also great because we use Secrets Manager, AWS Secrets Manager to manage the uh, passwords and logins for your Git so they can be secure, they're not in your notebook instance, you don't have to worry about that security angle. So um, it means you can also set this up with Service Catalog to have to write, note, write Git repositories for your whole data science team. Um, so we can start a notebook with that. I'm actually just going to dump it, jump in here to one that I've already started. You see, I started it with the same one. You can see my Git repo is cloned onto my instance as soon as I start. I can look at this. Now, the other thing we've been doing is we've been collaborating closely with the Jupyter open source community to enable new stuff in Jupyter. We believe Jupyter and the open source platform that Jupyter it represents is the future of data science, and we want to be contributing and participating in that. I'm going to show you the Git plugin here today. Um, first, let me change something so the Git gets interesting. Um, I'm just going to change this to have my own execution role rather than the one that the notebook was started with. So I'm going to use that role there. Um, maybe that's interesting, maybe it's not. Um, and now I want to look at the Git plugin. Now we've contributed this to open source. You can use this on SageMaker, but you can also use it in your own um, Jupyter installation. I should also point out that we're now running Jupyter Lab, um, the very latest version of Jupyter. Um, that's sort of the new standard for how to work with Jupyter. You'll see it has a nice tabbed interface and some other stuff. Yeah, it's so really I nice. I recommend you check it out. People who want to stay with Jupyter Classic can still do that. Um, but let's look at the, uh, the Git history. Um, oops, where is Git on my thing? Oh, so you can also oh, check it, it back into right. the repo if you've made so now, changes. So now we can see that it's changed. I actually don't have write permission on this particular repo, so we can't check it in. But we have a whole uh, thing here. I can look at the history of this repo, um, and I can work with Git. This plugin is being extended by Amazon and by the open source community, um, and so it gets just better and better. Um, really cool. So the other thing we find people have to do, and Kumar referenced this earlier when he was talking, is people want to understand the history of what they've done. So yeah. I'm going to talk about a new feature that we call SageMaker Search that lets you tie together executions. Um, so you can figure out which model was successful or which data set exactly, that trained that model exactly. was successful Exactly, one, one, one of the problems we have in ML is that we run lots and lots of training and things get better and worse and we try different things and they were right. working or maybe we get new data and the accuracy of a model is higher or lower and I want to be able to look at that over time. So let me, let me show an example of how that works here. Um, we have a notebook that runs, this notebook is, is running just a really simple example using the very common MNIST written digit data set. That's not really important, that, this is just for um, showing. And it shows that we uh, will run a classifier to try and figure out one of the digits. So I'm going to just run through this data set and run three different training models, tra changing one of the hyperparameters. In this, in this case, I'm, the hyperparameter I'm changing right here is the mini batch size. I'm going to run three different trainings with three different mini batch sizes. We pre-ran the training so we can... Uh, and of course, you could also use automatic model tuning if you really wanted to sweep through an entire, right. and, uh, and, entire set and or a range. Search, and this search feature works well with automatic training, automatic model training as well. So automatic model tuning as well. So, um, so we have this, and I have these three jobs I've trained. Yeah. Now I'm really interested in like what was different about them and what happened. So now I can set up a search to search for those three jobs. And you see here, um, I have search params. So I'm setting the, this is basically a query for my, tra my previous training jobs. I tagged each of those training jobs because SageMaker supports tags on all our entities. Right. Um, and so I can set tags on my entities that let me search for them later. I can also search for other properties, as we'll see in a minute. Um, but I have a special tag for this set of training jobs that I defined. We sort of slid over that. And I only want to look at completed training jobs. I don't want right. to see any in progress. So that second arm of and the query And then you're sorting. There. 
And then I'm sorting. I want to sort by what the objective loss was. I can see which training job was the best in terms of objective loss and which one wasn't. So let's do this search and we run the search. I can actually rerun all these. These things you got like a question it. here. Um, let's see, from not a feline, is there a plan to have Julia available in Jupiter? Um, that's something we're discussing. We love feedback on interest in new languages and platforms that we can support on our Jupiter uh, interface. So please uh, keep that feedback coming. Um, we haven't gotten a ton of interest in Julia yet, but it's something our antennas have been up for because I, for one, am a huge Julia fan. So um, I would love to see it. Um, so. Uh, now we can. We did the query and it returned four training jobs, and now we can write, render a pandas data frame with that those results in it. We see that we had. Oh, it picked up my one from when we ran it a minute ago. Sorry about that. Uh, but we see that it got luckily it got the same results, and uh, so uh, we see these three. When and in now you can increasing order them. of results, this last one got the best results. It's actually pretty close. We can graph it and we see there's not much difference. And, but and in real life, you're likely to see bigger differences. Yes, come on. And you can even see that the other run was five minutes ago, so you can see that they're spaced out in time. And that one was five minutes ago, and there were three different runs that are in the current uh, uh, in the current time frame. Now, another problem that another problem that comes up for people is being able to understand, I've deployed an endpoint to production and I'm running it into production and maybe it's doing surprisingly well or surprisingly poorly. And right. I'm like, what's going on? What happened? Where was the training that corresponds to that endpoint in production? So let's now uh, scoot down here. I've deployed one here and now we can trace the lineage. So by describing the endpoint and then the endpoint configuration and so on, I can, uh, I can get a picture and know where the actual model I trained was. I can then search, now I create a new search um, right here that says, hey, I know there's only one result, so I'm only going to get one result. But then I want something where the model artifact equals the model that I have in production now. Um, so I get one result, that's good, it found it. Um, and now I can sort of visualize and see what it is. Um, so here's the result of my search. I trained, I, I now know what's running at this endpoint. It was trained by this training job here. Um, this was the data it trained on, the ah, training data source URI. there you go, there's URI. the data yep. source. So I can see where data was. I can see what algorithm I used. I used Linear Learner version one. Um, and I can see all the hyperparameters, right? You know, for example, um, I can see uh, how what my mini batch size was. It was one. Um, what kind of predictor I wanted, and, and all these other things. And then I can, oops, um, and then if I go out here, I can see the, see the metrics that he used to run with um, and see where we were. So this gives us the ability to really understand the relationship between the things we do over time. So I think as you look about all these features we're launching today, what you're seeing is a group of relationship creating features on top of the original sort of uh, pillars of SageMaker. To make Plus, machine learning even more accessible to developers and businesses. To, to make it more accessible and also to make it easier to control machine learning when you get into real environments. In real yeah. environments, you're doing lots of training and lots of deployment. Lots of and data. And lots of data, and you're very concerned about um, what are the uh, what are the relationships between these? How am I doing? Am I getting better, worse, or whatever? Right. Now, I bet while we've been talking, the uh, the uh, workflow that we started earlier is either done or getting close yeah, to done. Yeah, so there's Andy two questions for Andy on the uh, workflows. To, to add one piece. more thing before we move on, I just wanted to make sure that the audience understands that if you have a step functions workflow that yeah. runs every day and produces these models, the, the integration with SageMaker Search will enable you to uh, not only take the results of that, but trace back on a particular day. So you can see, I've been running this for two weeks or three weeks, I can see last Tuesday something went bad, something changed, I can trace back, see what the data source was, see if maybe I changed the algorithm or something like that. And it's very easy using SageMaker Search to trace back. So you right, can, you can have pinpoint a, exactly. the source of success for a successful model, mm -hmm. which data set caused it, or failure. Exactly, exactly, and if you have a daily training job that uh, Step Functions enables you to create. So in the real world, you want to do this thing over and over again, it's not a one-off experiment. So if you can do this kind of thing over and over again, you want to be able to trace back and say, what went wrong on what day? How did we mess up? And it's important to have that in order to uh, be able to do these things in real settings. 
So we come back Let's hop back over to this step function demo. This workflow is, you know, in flight. You see, we've downloaded the data, we've completed a training job, we've created a model with that job, and right now it's running a transform. It just finished the transform job wow. and succeeded in the workflow. And you see, this workflow went all the way to finish line successfully. Um, you have a few questions now, here. Now the, what's um, the first question? Maysinger2 wants to know how this differs from a workflow engine. So Step Functions is a workflow engine. It's a fully managed workflow engine that lets you describe workflows in JSON. Now let's take a look at the JSON. This workflow we just ran, uh, behind the scenes, is written declaratively in JSON in a form we call the Amazon States language. And every state does something. In this case, a lot of times they do tasks. The first task we did in downloading the data, we did with a Lambda function. Right. Lambda, AWS Lambda is a service for those who aren't familiar with it, if there are folks who haven't heard of it. Um, lets you run code without managing servers and underlying compute. My favorite thing. Upload code, it just runs. So in this case, we have a task state, and we give it the resource, which is the Lambda ARN. It runs that Lambda function, and when it's done, it moves on to the next step, which is uh, create, create, a, create a model, in this case, a training job. This is what's new today, is we've introduced these things we call magic ARNs, which dispatch work to SageMaker and wait for SageMaker to finish his job. A SageMaker training job can last 10 minutes to 10 days, to maybe 10 months in some cases. 28 days even. 28 so now you days. can automate running your machine learning workflows. From a mm -hmm. single state. That's incredible. And the beauty of step functions is workflows and step functions can be open for up to one year, which means if you have very long running training jobs with many steps, step functions can supervise this without anybody having to worry about when the transitions need to take place. So when this job completes, uh, say step functions moves on to the next step, which is to create that model and then create the, the transform job. So you write this in, in JSON, but when you write the JSON, you can then see code like this. And of course, we saw earlier, we can also access this um, uh, from a notebook using the Boto3 SDK as well. Yeah, we did see that. We have a question from ABOM TV: will step functions support YAML? Good question. We listen to our customers. We've had a lot of customers asking for YAML support instead of JSON. That's something we're looking at very closely right now. So it's, it's coming. Uh, earlier, from back when you started it, uh, Java Guy one says, wait, show me the workflow definition. Can it trigger something besides a Lambda, which I believe you just showed us. Yeah, so what we launched today is integration. When Step Functions launched two years ago at reInvent, we supported uh, integration with Lambda Functions. What we announced this week is eight more service integrations. Two of them eight we're talking more. about today are with uh, Amazon SageMaker, SageMaker and AWS Glue. Six additional ones we integrated with uh, AWS Batch for batch transform jobs. Um, uh, AWS Fargate, as well as uh, Amazon ECS for container workflows, dropping messages on SNS and SQS, those are the notification and, and queue services, and the ability to, to do CRUD operations on Dynamo tables. Uh, and all eight of those are available now, uh, worldwide where Step Functions is available on AWS. And, and you have a customer that's doing something with a, a human in the loop as part of the uh, uh, approval workflow, correct? Yeah. So earlier this week, Cox Automotive talked to us about their collaborative effort between their data scientists, which they call decision scientists, and their software engineering team. And they're actually able to use Step Functions to create a human in the loop approval process where the data scientists could review and approve a SageMaker model before it was deployed into, into software production pipelines. Um, that was API 325. If you want to look it up online, you can find it and see uh, Jeremy Irwin from Cox Automotive talking about that architecture. That is super we have one cool. last question here. Um, David R7777, do you need to write JSON or can you drag and drop Lambda functions together? So I'm glad you asked. So today, um, the primary way is to write uh, in JSON, but we are working with a new feature on the way that's currently in developer preview called Cloud Developer Kit. It's available on GitHub. It's being CDK. developed in open source, the CDK. I love the CDK. And we're working with the CDK to create a library that will let you compose your workflows in the language of your choosing and have it deployed through CloudFormation to step functions. That's awesome, cdksports.net. So I'm going to start writing my step function workflows in, uh, in the CDK then, after you guys support that. Okay, it looks like I don't have any more questions. Java One guy says, thank you to you, because that was the code that he wanted to see when you pulled up the, uh, the JSON object. You're welcome. Um, no more questions from the audience. We're going to wrap here. Thank you guys so much for joining me today to talk about Amazon SageMaker and AWS Step Functions. Really excited to see the integration between the two. Uh, we'll tune in more. We'll have more content for you the rest of the day. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you all, Thanks, guys. Bye.